I've been hearing a lot of comments lately about micro oxygenation and if this is something you should be thinking about as a home winemaker on a really small scale. So today we're going to talk about what is micro oxygenation, why is it something that people do, and um, how does this apply to someone who's maybe not making wine on a really large scale like these you know, thousand gallon batches. Um, as home wine makers, we're more used to things like six gallons at a time up to 30 or 60 gallons at a time. So micro oxygenation is a technique that is used to try to replicate what's happening in a wine barrel. So if you're making wine in, you know, a 1000 or 2000 gallon tank, that's mostly sealed, you're gonna to struggle to replicate this kind of slow contact with oxygen that happens in a wine barrel, which is traditionally how a red wine would be aged. And in these wine barrels, you've got a couple of things happening. You've got um, this slow kind of evaporation happening as the wine kind of evaporates through the porous wood and I think that's actually, to me, that's the biggest benefit of a barrel is that concentration effect. But the other advantage of a barrel is over time, you're getting this really, really slow oxygen exposure, which can help to round out the tannins in a big, bold red wine. It can make it drinkable a little bit sooner. Um, it can help stabilize the color. It it can kind of just add a little bit of texture or body to the wine. So these things are generally perceived as good things. Now there's other things with a barrel, like if you use a small barrel, like a 15 gallon barrel, that it's just hard to manage because you're micro oxygenating at such a fast rate that if you're not on top of the SO2, sulfur dioxide, and measuring it every time you top up that barrel every month or so, you're gonna oxidize that wine to a bad place really quickly. I mean, as quick as something like three months. So, that being said, so that's, that's what you're trying to replicate with micro oxidation. The way they do it at these big wineries is they have some really precision oxygen metering equipment that can add oxygen to these big tanks at such a slow rate that before that bubble ever gets to the surface, it's already dissolved in the wine. The ideal situation is the bubbles never actually break the surface. So they'll put this oxygen in through a stone really low in the tank and they'll do it at such a, a slow rate, like for instance, 10 milliliters per liter per month, even all the way down to like, one milliliter per liter per month. So on something like a six gallon, if you try to replicate that, you're talking like like a racquetball sized amount of oxygen that you're trying to add as slow as possible throughout the span of a whole month. Um, so you can see it's really very precision equipment that they're using to do this. And it's not something you kind of want to willy nilly just kind of start bubbling oxygen into your wine. Personally, I don't think that you need to do micro oxygenation when you're working at small volumes like these six gallon, five gallon, three gallon, one gallon jugs. And I'll talk about why. So this here, this is a um, growler, which I like to use little things like this, one gallon jugs and growlers to catch any overflow. Like if you rack a six gallon into a five gallon, you might end up with something, some odd amount of wine, like a half a gallon left. And what you'll notice on here is I've got a screw cap on it. In, instead of a airlock, like I've got on all of these, and it's not that I can't put an airlock on here. I actually will if this is still actively bubbling and it'll fit fine with a number like a six and a half stopper. But the reason I don't have an airlock on here, this is done fermenting. And what I found with anything a gallon or smaller is if you put an airlock on, meaning, you know, your little bubbler here, 
it will, like clockwork, oxidize or start to show subtle signs of oxidation after a few months in that small storage container. So one way or another, oxygen is in fact getting in there, even if you've got it topped up all the way to the tippy top like I always like to do. And I think I've come up with some maybe th theories I think are pretty sound as to how is that oxygen getting in there when you've got such a sealed thing. The most simple thing is, you know, as the air cools um, and heats throughout the daily cycle, the wine could expand and contract a little bit and actually push a bubble this way and then push a bubble back the other way, which would just be a pretty simple way to get oxygen into there. But I don't think that's the whole story because the temperature is pretty stable down here. You don't really see these airlocks pushing, like I don't think they're cycling once a day or anything like that. Maybe over the span of a whole season, it might get hot enough to push a bubble this way and cool enough to push a bubble the other way. But I think one other way that you can get oxygen into these containers is if you've got water or I like to use um, alcohol in my airlocks, oxygen is soluble in these liquids. So if you've ever had an aquarium, you know you're trying to dissolve water and oxygen so these little fish can breathe. Um, it's actually more soluble than something like nitrogen. So over time, even at just normal atmospheric pressure, you're going to slowly dissolve oxygen into this little liquid or water or alcohol that you've got in your airlock. And even if you've got pure CO2 in your headspace, it's going to try to come to an equilibrium. So if you've got a little bit of dissolved water in here, it's probably going to try to put a little or a little bit of dissolved oxygen in here. It's going to probably try to put a little bit of that dissolved oxygen into this headspace. Um, in addition to that, you've also got, now I'm using all glass airlocks. These things are really, really nice. I've been digging these lately. But what I otherwise would use are these um, plastic airlocks. And as we know, plastic is not totally super airtight. That's why you'll see some really fancy things going on in ketchup bottles where they've got like seven layers of plastic to try to prevent that oxygen from permeating through that plastic. So I think another source of oxygen could be, you know, there's a decent amount of surface area here in these plastic airlocks that it could slowly, slowly just leak a little tiny bit of oxygen through that way. And the third thing would be um, your stopper. So silicone stoppers, even these rubber stoppers, I think rubber is a little bit more um, restrictive than like a silicone, but in either case, you could expect that maybe there could be some minuscule amount of leakage. So that being said, I don't really think you need more oxygen. Um, I'll notice, I'll measure the free sulfur dioxide in these things periodically and you'll always see it dropping and dropping and dropping over time. And that could be reacting with things in the wine, but it's also could be reacting with oxygen. Um, if you've ever had a wine that's too low on sulfite and maybe the pH is relatively high, like 3.7, and you just let it be even topped up like this for six months and you take the lid off and smell it, sometimes you'll smell a slight, slight, bit of acetaldehyde, which is that nutty sherry smell and a really early sign of oxidation, but you'll smell it right on the surface level. And it's usually so low that if you take a sample from below the surface, you won't have it. But again, we're getting some micro oxidation. Um, beyond that, of course, you take your bung off, you test. I, I've been trying to, you know, put a little either argon, nitrogen, or CO2 back in the top as soon as I put my airlock on after I take a sample and of course always keep it topped up. But as you can see, 
you know, lots and lots of ways to get like more oxygen than you actually want when you're working on ultra small scale winemaking like this. If you ever are working with, you know, little one gallons of wine, I, I don't love to bulk age in that small of a size for that long, unless you do have it hard capped with like a screw cap and you might even want to give it like a little shake every once in a while and crack it. Just make sure there's not any pressure building up in that because you don't want to, sh it'll shatter it if it actually tried to ferment in here. You might ask, well, why don't you just, if you're trying to prevent oxygen, just put a, um, like a solid bung on here. And I've experimented with that, but that is so scary. <laughs> Um, I found that a little expansion can just pop that bung right out. And if you're not down here checking it constantly, you might go a few days with a missing um, bung or stopper. And of course, that is a recipe for just total disaster. So we don't want to ever see that happen. My system for kind of trying to minimize oxygen is this. I use these um, rubber stoppers. Um, I'll use these glass airlocks with alcohol, which I just like that if like a fruit fly or something gets in there, it's sterile. You're not gonna have to worry about anything there. And then what I put on the top of these is um, a marble. So it just kind of makes this gas very stagnant in here. So as the CO2 tries to push out, I, I like to think I sort of trap it in there pretty nicely and that seems to work out pretty good. So the summary, if you want to play with microoxidation, I would almost just say don't, <laughs> but hey, it's up to you. And if you have any experience with this on a really small scale and have actually seen success, I'd love to hear it in the comments below. If you like um, content like this, make sure to subscribe. And for more content, you can always check out my website, smartwinemaking.com. And for even more exclusive content, you can swing by my Patreon page, patreon.com slash makewine. Thanks for watching.